not run itself. And it's the whole thing simply now to introduce Mr. Michael Rosenbaum to talk to us about the uh, highlights of a journey back through time. He's the Emeritus Professor of Engineering Geology at Nottingham, lives in Ludlow, and has numerous books and publications to his name. So Mr. Michael Rosenbaum, it's all <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for inviting me to come and talk to you this morning. It's such lovely weather and when, um, usually when, when, when a geologist is faced with, with conditions like this, the first inclination is get on the mountain boots and outside. And I thought of that actually, I thought well, maybe I could give the talk on the banks of the Severn. Um, but then I thought well the logistics of dealing with that is maybe not so sensible. Um, so here we are and thank you very much for coming. Um, Looking at the title, you might not think this is anything about geology, but my background in geology means that that is actually what my talk is going to be about. Um, some of you will, um, you know, living in Shrewsbury, will, may have um, got, gone to talks by a colleague of mine, Peter Toghill. And Peter is a very well-known um, um, person in the subject in this area. For many years, of course, he taught the extramural studies for the University of Birmingham. Although now retired, he um, is still a very interesting person to listen to. But my talk will have absolutely nothing to do with the talk which Peter <coughs> may have given to you before. The normal way in which a geologist would start talking about um, highlights of a journey is by starting at the beginning and working their way through it towards the present day. Usually managing to get to just about the time that the dinosaurs were present on the planet and then running out of time. <laughs> So I'm going to do it the exact opposite way. I'm going to start from sort of the present day, although as you'll see in a moment it's not literally the present day, and work my way backwards. And I know I'm not going to get back to the beginning of time, so don't think that I have misjudged my lecture when I don't mention anything that is older than the dinosaurs. So, where the journey begins then is in Shrewsbury, but relatively recent, geologically speaking, when this was the scene. And um, woolly mammoths wandering over the landscape and some of our ancestors there attempting fishing in a very cold River Severn. Now, whether or not early man was a contemporary with the mammoths in Shropshire is conjecture. There's no direct evidence of that. But there is direct evidence of both living in Shropshire, even if not literally at the same time. So it sets the scene. And by this stage, you've probably read that the last glaciation to affect Shropshire had the name Devensian. And that period um, ended about 20,000 years ago, which geologically is almost nothing, and um, began some 80 or, so, or 80 or so thousand years previously to that. So it was a fairly long period of cold conditions. It wasn't, however, the coldest phase of what one might call the Ice Age. That goes um, by the name of the Anglian, and that was nearly half a million years ago. And that ice covered almost the entire part of the county. So this is a, um, if one could fly in an aeroplane during the Anglian, 450,000 years ago, it says at the bottom of the screen there, um, looking northwards across the county, this is what you can see. It's actually Greenland, but it serves as a very useful analogy for what the county was like at that time. And uh, we've got um, the, um, the circle, it shows Shrewsbury, so that's where we are. And to the east, we have uh, Staffordshire Highlands, like the Cannock Chase, the Reakin, and the Clean Hills, just off the field of view. But they would have looked something like my um, model of the, of, of, of the Long Mint here, and the Berins, which were sticking up above the level of the ice across the county. Everywhere else smothered. And that ice got thicker and thicker as you go northwards and westwards. Westwards towards Wales, the ice was probably a kilometre thick. Northwards towards Scotland, it was probably more than that. A kilometre and a half, maybe two kilometres in thickness. A huge volume of ice. <laughs> now, how does um, ice behave 
<coughs> when you have such a large amount on the ground? Well, this is a cartoon which sort of shows some of the processes which are involved with ice when it's on this continental scale. And the diagram has got an enormous vertical exaggeration compared to the horizontal. Um, I would think um, a typical continental ice sheet will be something of the order of 1,000 kilometres, maybe 2,000 kilometres across. But the thickness will be of the order of one or two kilometres. So you've got a gross vertical to horizontal exaggeration of scale. You have an area of accumulation of, um, of, of snow within the interior of the ice mass, which, with burial by more snow, gradually gets compressed and recrystallized to form glacial ice. And this is the area which is known as the zone of accumulation. At lower altitudes and towards the margins of the ice sheet, where the air temperatures are warmer and the land temperature is warmer, then you get an area of melting, what is known as ablation, which is what we have down there. And there's an equilibrium line in between the two. Now, when ice gets compressed by the weight of more ice above it, it actually recrystallizes, and in recrystallizing, it moves. <coughs> And you can simulate this by flow lines running through the model of the glacier. And these arrows here show the general direction of movement from the area of accumulation through to the area of the melting of the ice in the ablation area. So that's the general sort of movement that takes place. Now, as the ice moves, as it moves over the ground advancing away from the area of accumulation, it's moving over ground which may or may not be that cold. Um, it, some places it will be warm, some places it will be extremely cold. Well, let's not get into the complications of that as far as Shropshire is concerned at the moment. In general terms, if you've got warmish ground over which the ice is advancing, then the water within the soils of that ground will be in liquid form. It's what's called a wet area which is what we have here. Whereas in the interior of the ice, the intense cold from the ice will tend to freeze the water within the ground underneath the ice, which gives us a dry area. Um, now, there are exceptions to that, but I won't get into those complications because it's not particularly relevant to today. <laughs> now, when you have got the ice moving over a dry area, then essentially the ice at the base of the glacier is frozen into the ground and doesn't move. So the movement in the ice takes place higher up the column of the ice. And this diagram here illustrates that, um, so that we are going from um, essentially getting a little bit of movement in the lower parts of the ice sheet, and it gets more and more as you go up towards the ice surface. That contrasts with the movement of ice where you have got relatively warm ground over which the ice is moving, which we have on the right. We have the same general component of movement, except the arrows are longer, indicating we've got a greater degree of movement, in other words, a faster movement of ice. And at the bottom of the ice column, the ice is not frozen into the ground, it actually slides over the top. So there's what's called basal sliding taking place at the bottom of the ice column. So the ice at the margins is moving faster and it's sliding over the ground underneath. Now that has an impact on the way that the ground responds to this great mass of ice that's, that's on top of it. Where we have got dry conditions, you have essentially a preservation of the old landscape. So whatever was there before the ice moved over is still there and will be there once the ice melts totally. But at the margins, where you've got this wet area, then you have got a lot of erosion taking place because the ice is sliding over the ground. And of course it's melting. That melting in part is at the front of the ice sheet, in part is underneath <coughs> the ice sheet. And so we can get the, the, a succession of underglacier under rivers forming. And those underglacier rivers are, being, um, um, are causing the water to move from under the ice, where the ice load is high, 
through to the margins where the pressure is low. That is not necessarily going to be downhill as we would understand it now. It's going from where the ice pressure is high to where the ice pressure is low. The importance of that will become apparent um, shortly. So that's the basic way in which a large glacier um, a, a large glacier behaves. And it's a large glacier like this which is what swamped Shropshire, both in the Anglian 450,000 years ago and in the Devensian um, just a few tens of thousands of years ago. Now, <coughs> what about a map of Shropshire which is a little bit less hypothetical and a little bit more based on what can be observed? Well, what we discover is that during the last glaciation, the Devensian, where there were actually two big glaciers that affected our <coughs> part of the world. There was a glacier that developed in Wales and moved eastwards. So we've got the, the mid-Wales area through here on the left of the diagram, and the big arrows are showing the direction of the movement of the ice from the mid-Wales area eastwards into Shropshire and also into Cheshire. The red circle on the right is Shrewsbury. The arrows are based in part on <coughs> special landforms which are known as drumlins. A drumlin looks a bit like the hull of a boat which is inverted and it's elongated in the direction in which the ice is moving. So these black blobs, notice they're not circular, they're, 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 they're elliptical, they are orientated in the um, direction in which the ice is moving. So the, from Welshpool towards Shrewsbury, we can see that the ice movement is generally speaking northeastwards. As you go into the North Wales area, you see the direction of movement is more in a northerly direction. Now that Welsh ice was moving um, locally, it was moving along the valley of the River Severn. And in those days, the River Severn rose more or less where it does today, flowing through Newtown and Welshpool, and then rather than turning east, going past this building, it instead continued northwards, west of, Sh west of Oswald Street and, Sh and Chester, to come out into the Irish Sea in the Dee Estuary. The Dee Estuary is the flooded part of the sea, seaward end of the River Severn. And this Welsh ice coming um, over um, eastwards blocked that Severn River Valley. And it diverted the river further east. Well, it could have gone east <coughs> of Oswald Street and Chester and still got back to the River Dee were it not for the fact that a huge mass of ice was moving southwards across what is now the Irish Sea Basin, and that, known as Irish Sea Ice, although the Irish Sea didn't exist, well, I'll explain why in a moment, flowed southwards, and basically pushed the front of the Welsh ice back. Now, it didn't physically cause the glass, Welsh glacier to move backwards, it basically meant that the ablation um, was, what, the, the ablation was happening faster than the accumulation of the ice and the gap was taken up by the Irish Sea ice. So we've got both an eastward movement of ice in Shropshire and a southward movement of ice. <coughs> now the reason why I said that the Irish Sea didn't actually exist because where on earth does all the water come from to um, build these huge continental glaciers? And it's been calculated that the amount of water needed to make the glaciers that we had during the Devensian period form would require all the water in the world's oceans down from the present level of the ocean to a depth of 120 metres. So basically, worldwide, sea levels dropped by 120 metres to give enough water for these huge continental ice sheets to develop. And with that in mind, people have actually looked at the um, shallow shelf areas <coughs> and found evidence of terrestrial conditions. So it's been proven both by direct observation and by deduction from looking at the evidence of where the ice was and how big the ice sheets might have been. If we go back to the um, biggest ice sheet, which was the Anglian, then the sea level would have had to have dropped to something like 150 metres below the present <coughs> level. 
So that gives you a feeling for just how big a change in geography takes place as you get the onset of these very cold conditions and these huge continental ice sheets developing. <coughs> now what about the evidence that we have within Shropshire for these ice movements? Well, here is an example of, of sediment, um, it's, it's largely sand, in a little pit near to the station, railway station at Church Stretton. It's actually about 800 metres northeast of, of where the station is today. And within this pit we can see sand which has been dumped by the melting of the uh, Irish Sea ice, because this is about as far south as it managed to get. Um, now normally when you have layers of, 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 of sand and sediment deposited by a river flowing along a riverbed, it forms relatively horizontal sheets of sediment. But if you look carefully around where the spade is in this pit, there's a spade, you can see that the bedding, these lines here, are at a very steep angle. Now that indicates one of two things. One, that the sediment maybe has been distorted after it was laid down as more or less horizontal sheets, or it was never deposited as horizontal sheets in the first place. Now distortion could have happened as a result either of being pushed by ice, so the layers were laid down of this sand that you see in this pit and then the ice sheet re-advanced and it acted literally like a bulldozer and tipped the sediments up on end, so that's one possibility. The other one is that there were, as the ice was retreating, so it left large blocks of stagnant ice behind, and the river depositing the sediment coming from the melting glacier deposited that sediment around the stagnant ice. With time, the stagnant ice melted, and then the sediment around the sides collapsed in towards where the stagnant ice mass used to be. That forms what's called a kettle hole, <coughs> and north of Shrewsbury there are lots and lots of kettle holes. Often you can detect them these days because they have mirrors within them, little boggy areas, and they form topographic depressions, which of course people have, um, which nowadays are, are, are havens for wildlife. Before that they were sources of fairly reliable <coughs> water supply. So from a human point of view, they're actually really useful. They also tend to be areas which are not well drained and in which anything which was trying to go for a drink of water and, and, and failed or got <coughs> stuck in the mud would then die and become buried as part of the debris in the bottom of the kettle holes. And that's how the so-called Shropshire mammoths became preserved. They're in fact probably the youngest mammoths that we have in the country, dated at about 18,000 years ago. Right, so that's one type of, of evidence that we have. Um, then the other is what happens actually at the edge of the glacier. And for that I, I, I can show you this slide, which is a little bit further south at Lempster in North Herefordshire, which is a terminal moraine. That is actually literally at the edge of where the glacier reached. But this glacier didn't come across the Irish Sea Basin, this glacier came from mid Wales. And in this glacier, you can see there's a mixture of fine grained sediment, it's actually largely sand, together with really quite substantial boulders the size of a person. And this gives rise to an old name that geologists called the sediments formed by glaciers, which was boulder clay. With a sediment which consists of boulders in a matrix which is clay, this seems perfectly reasonable. But if you have the glaciers of the type that we have in North Shropshire, about Shrewsbury, there are no boulders and there's no clay. So to call this boulder clay is really rather <laughs> silly, since it contains neither. And so therefore the term um, moraine is a more general term which is used to describe this material. And you might also see, in, in, if you read books about glaciations, another term called till, um, the difference between till and moraine is fairly fine and we needn't worry further about it at the moment, but they're essentially synonymous as far as we're concerned. Now, what about the extent of this Deventian ice? We can see evidence 
in Shropshire and North Herefordshire of the edge of this ice and from the general landforms we get an idea of what the shape of the ice mass was like. By comparing it with modern glaciers like the one in Greenland, got an idea of, of, of what the profile of the ice sheet might, might have been. Now if we know what the general size of the ice mass is, then we know how much water has been taken out of the sea to allow those ice sheets to build up. And if we lower the water level, that affects the geography. And if the geography is affected, then so too will be the climate. In other words, places where wind can pick up moisture, where wind will tend to be relatively dry, where winds are blowing over large ice sheets and therefore will be very cold, or they're blowing over temperate um, vegetated areas like the UK is today, in which case they'll be relatively warm, and so on. And that allows a model of climate to be built up. So, with these lines of evidence then, you can say, right, well, I know where the sea levels are, I know where the, what the temperatures are likely to be, I know what the rainfall is likely to be at any given configuration of the ice sheet. <laughs> and from that, a mathematical model can be constructed of what the ice sheet must have been, might have been like. Now, a project uh, called Brit Ice, which um, I forget exactly what Brit Ice stands for, but it isn't just British Ice, but it looks pretty much as though that would be perfect. Um, has been a project involving several universities over the last decade. And they have produced a model which I think is absolutely fascinating for describing the way in which the last glaciation of the country took place. Now this model I'm going to show you in a moment in the form of a series of time pictures like this one that you see of the UK on the right. Um, at 50 year intervals from 38,000 years ago. So 38 Ka BP means 38,000 years before present. The, um, there's a little wavy line in the top left. That wavy line is the, um, shows what the average temperature is at the time. So where the little white arrow is on the left-hand side of that diagram, just here, we've got the um, time at which the present geography is shown. So at the moment, this is on the left-hand side of that graph, which is 38,000 years ago, and with time, as time slices go pi, you'll see that arrow moving from left to right to the present, uh, well, actually to about... Um, 18,000 years ago, which is the end of ice in the country, and the geography looks much like it does at the present day, um, it'll end up on the right-hand side. Now, the detailed temperature of the air actually fluctuates much more than that, and the blue line, which you see wriggles up and down rather, that is the, 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 the supposed um, temperature of, of, of the air, which relates also to the temperature of the seawater. And we know that from the isotopes in, of oxygen within little fossils of creatures that lived at the time. Now, that creates um, a, a, a remarkable time picture of how the um, Earth has been over the last few tens of thousands of years. The ice will build up and is coloured on this diagram and it's coloured according to how fast the ice is moving. When, if you remember back to that second picture I showed you, when the ground is very cold, the ice sitting on it hardly moves. By comparison to where the ground is relatively warm, and then the ice can um, have a component of basal shear, and it can move really very fast. When the ice is moving slowly, it will have a blue colour, and as you go through the colours of the rainbow, it gets faster and faster. So reds and whites will be really fast moving. At the moment, on the map of the country, there is no ice apart from a, cup, a little blue blob, because I can't quite start this picture at zero, at the 38,000 years ago, so at 38,000 and a weeny bit. But that needn't worry us. So what's going to happen then is over the next few minutes, you're going to see this... Um, geography of the country that we understand or think we understand so well change as we go through the Devensian glaciation. <laughs> 
I should say that this is the last phase of the Devensian glaciation, because the Devensian, if you remember from one of my other diagrams, started about 110,000 years ago, not just 38. So in fact, the country has been through two or three of these cycles within the Devensian. I'm just showing you the last one. And there are still discussions and arguments about whether we really are out of the Devensian. Because it is only a few, ten, a few, well, maybe um, 18,000 years ago or so since the end of permanent ice. And that compared to the time before the previous advance of ice in the Devensian is actually not dissimilar. So it may be we're just in the warm phase of the Devensian glaciation. And that rather than worries of global warming, we should be worried about global cooling. It's one of the curious things about the way in which the Earth's climate is changing at the moment. Because worldwide, there is a warming, and I don't try and deny that. But the effect of that warming could be to cause the warm water of the Atlantic, which causes the Gulf Stream, to decay completely. Which is something that seems to have happened during the pre run up to the um, cold phases of the Devensia. So, if the Gulf Stream stops, what that means is that warm water will no longer get to Western Europe, and we'll have a climate like the east, that, that, like, like the eastern side of the United of, the, of North America, at the same sort of out of same sort of latitude, and that will mean that we will have a sufficiently cold air tem water temperature for permanent ice to start growing again in the UK. And once you get permanent ice growing, it gets bigger and bigger each year. We have the beginnings of a new ice age. So curiously, global warming might mean for the UK the onset of permanent ice cover. Not necessarily a happy consequence or an obvious consequence of the doom and gloom scenarios of global warming. Anyway, with that as a bit of background, I now have to do, I hope this will work, a curious combination of, ta of, of keys on the keyboard to get me to the bit of the, um, of, of, of the presentation which shows you how the world is going to change. Good, right, so far so good. What I need to do now is click on this, and we will start to see, I hope, the world changing. In the top left, but I'm afraid it's slightly out of the screen, it looks fine on mine, but what we've got here is the countdown, which at the moment is reading 35.65 thousand years ago. And you notice the great splodge of colour in Scotland, Blue in colour, it's not moving very fast. So we have got large amounts of ice forming in Scotland. What the SNP would make of that, I don't know, especially with the colour. <laughs> However, um, down here in Shropshire, nothing much except in mid Wales now, about um, 30,000 years ago, we're getting the build up of, of ice. Not quite getting into Shropshire, but it's trying its hardest. 29,000 years ago, it seems to have given up. It's retreated. It's melted from Wales. It's almost melted from Scotland. Notice how towards the end of that build-up of blue, it suddenly went red and white. That's when you have the collapse of the glacier. Maybe I'll mention, uh, talk a little more about that in a moment. When you get collapse of glacier, the glacier moves really fast over warm ground. Now, 23,000 years ago, huge expanse of ice getting down into Shropshire and Cheshire. This was the extent of the Irish sea ice, and now Shrewsbury is swamped by ice. Didn't get past Church Stretton, though, <laughs> but never mind. Um, and it whizzed down towards the Bristol Channel as well. So the bright, bright red areas, fast-moving ice, the blue areas, slow-moving ice. And now 18,000 years ago, Shropshire is now ice-free. The ice is retreating. Um, it'll go back to about 15,000 years ago, we're at 16 at the moment, and then there'll be a little bit of a re-advance, which known as the Loch Lomond re-advance, and then the ice effectively melts. So the Loch Lomond re-advance is happening about now, about Loch Lomond, would you believe, and in, in, in the western part of the Grampians, and then now, what, 12,000 years ago, it's almost all gone, final bit of ice collapse, 
and then we have the geography of the present day. So that's how the last glaciation basically <coughs> behaved. And that um, change of colour of the ice towards the end of the glacial advance, when it went from the blue slow moving colour to the red and white very fast moving colours, that was the state of the ice affecting our part of the world of, in Shropshire. And the consequence of that is that it actually um, brought with it a great flood of melt water which redistributed sediment from the ice it caused a lot of erosion of features and it caused, in particular, the development of gorges by rivers much bigger than the rivers we have in the present day under the margins of the ice sheets. So, if we go back to the slides, not quite, I'll do it again. No, I'm going to have to do something a bit cleverer by the looks of things. Bear with me, it worked fine in rehearsal, it doesn't look quite so fine now. Let's see if that will work. I think it will. Yep. So this is the landscape then that we would have seen from um, Shrewsbury looking southwards across Condover towards the Stretton Hills to the south about um, 20 to 18,000 years ago. A landscape, the higher ground, Kyakaradok and the Long Mind, um, there we are, Kyakaradok and the Long Mind, um, looking much as they do at the present day. In the middle ground to foreground, the undulating hills around here, around Condover, looking, <coughs> well, of course they're looking like they are in the present day, this is a photograph of the present day, but it would have looked like this 18 to 20,000 years ago, except perhaps for the type of trees. And it was over this landscape that the mammoths were wandering, went down for a drink in the hollows where the stagnant ice had melted and then tragedy hit as they, um, the ones which we have the preserved um, fossil remains from got stuck in the mud, died, were buried in the sediment to then be unearthed about 30 years ago now and, uh, and, and studied um, more, more recently. So that is the kind of, um, if you like, the latest phase of the evolution of the landscape that we have in Shropshire. The margins of this ice sheet, as I say, were a, an area where you have got the um, presence of, of melting of the ice and significant underground rivers forming. When the river develops underneath a glacier, it's been pushed by the pressure of the ice. It's like looking at or comparing the pressure of um, water going through um, a fireman's hose with water flowing through an open channel. The open channel, a river as we would understand it. The water through a fireman's hose, that is like the water that is being pushed by the pressure of the ice through the ground beneath the ice and then out. Much more aggressive in terms of an erosion uh, in terms of erosion and in terms of modifying the landscape. This is just looking at the mouth of, of, of a very little river um, coming out from underneath the glacier in Norway, just to sort of give you a feel. But we're looking at rivers bigger than the River Seven of the present day in terms of the way in which we can think of these features informing our landscape. <coughs> Now, in terms of where the meltwater channels or these subglacial channels have developed, this map of um, North Shropshire going into the southern part of Cheshire gives you an idea of where they are. Um, there are actually, um, there's a bit of a re-advance of the ice, which is why we have caught two couplets of warm-based ice and cold-based ice. That's associated with one glacial advance. The ice then came back again, and we have another warm-based ice mass coming over the top. But it only got to the southern part of Cheshire. We therefore don't need to worry about it much more. Let's look at that earlier phase that affects us. So in the warm-based subglacial system, that's where we have these rivers forming underneath the glacier. And a whole series of river channels have been identified one of which comes right underneath where we are at the moment, through Shrewsbury. 
There are huge thicknesses of sand underneath Shrewsbury, which have clogged up that gorge. <coughs> now, how big was the gorge? Well, that's easy enough to answer, because if we go a little bit further downstream, we get to Ironbridge. And by a fluke of geography, the gorge through Ironbridge, caused by this subglacial formation, trapped the waters from the modern River Severn. And the River Severn has washed out the sands from within that gorge, so the shape and configuration of the Ironbridge Gorge as we know it today, although formed under the margins of the glacier, um, are free of sediment within it. And that is the size of the channel which underlies Shrewsbury, clogged with this material, but it's not unique. There are another three or four going eastwards towards the east of the county. So, there we have the, 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 the basic geography of Shropshire caused by the uh, development of the glaciers. Now, it's allowed me to introduce Ironbridge Gorge, and so here's a picture of, of how Ironbridge was um, during the height of the industrial development in the, in the late um, 18th, early 19th centuries. <coughs> Ironbridge today, of course, is quite a tourist heaven, or haven, I'm not quite sure which, one or the other. Um, and th this is a picture of, 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 of the gorge to sort of start to bring us a little bit back down to earth. A lot of the <coughs> industry which developed within Ironbridge was as a result of much older geology, nothing to do with the glaciation. The incidence of, 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 of iron ore, fuel in the form of coal, and flux in the form of limestone are the basic ingredients to make iron. Later on, with the refinement of the processes, steel. So the manufacturing industries really could, start, could <coughs> develop as a result of this happy combination of um, geological materials. Now, with that industrialization came a great deal of wealth, not necessarily for the people working on the shop floor, but for the owners of the various um, quarries and mines producing the goods, uh, sorry, producing the raw materials for making iron and steel, and also for the owners of the industries which actually made uh, various goods <coughs> from those raw materials. That allowed a period of enlightenment, as it's called, to, um, to, to become established, in which people actually had enough money to not have to worry about how they could actually afford to buy food and put a roof over their heads and, the, their, and of their families, but instead could think about higher things in life. A little bit like us at the moment, able to enjoy U3A lectures and, 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 and learn more about the world around us. And a particular group of people came together in this area, um, financed effectively through monies made directly or indirectly through the industries of the Iron Bridge Gorge, and they formed a sort of a, a, a precursor of the U3A, known as the Lunar Society. And one important member of, uh, uh, the, well, sorry, I'll come to members a little later. Um, that, I'm going to skip just a couple of pictures here because it doesn't quite follow from what I'm, I'm, I'm saying. Um, but the, um, the, this period of, of the Enlightenment brought together people from the, um, from the area to sort of think about where we were coming from, where we were going to. And one of the things they thought about was the nature of the ground that was producing these very useful materials like coal and iron ore and lime for um, the manufacture of the iron and steel. <coughs> And there, essentially there were two schools of thought about where the ground was coming from. One school of thought was that uh, what we had was effectively the um, distribution of sediment that was coming from water, directly or indirectly. Directly through bodies of water like the sea and through rivers, indirectly through frozen water like ice, or from wind blowing material up and then letting the material settle either on land or in water. This idea of effectively a waterborne origin for the ground became known as the Neptunist theory of the evolution of, of, of the ground. 
It contrasted with another school of thought which realised that there were places in the world where the ground was extremely hot, so hot that the rock was melting, producing volcanoes. And that within the great mass of the earth, there must be an enormous amount of heat. And that any effect that we see of the rock on the surface of the earth must be to do, directly or indirectly, with this huge body of heat within the earth's interior. And that became known as the Plutonist theory. And at the time of the Lunar Society, it wasn't clear at all whether the Neptunists or the Plutonists were correct. There was, of course, another theory about how the world um, had come to the way that it was, and that was in the, in, in, in the pages of the Bible, which seemed, through Noah's flood, to be much more in tune with the Neptunist approach. So the general populace was rather more comfortable with the Neptunist theory than with the Plutonists. Now what was good about not only thinking about these things was also having the time to go and look at exposures of the rocks. What could the ground actually tell us by looking at it? And because there were many quarries and mines open at the time producing the raw materials I've mentioned, um, this provided the opportunity for amateur naturalists to be making a contribution. Um, Gilbert White is perhaps somebody that you may have heard of. He was a very famous naturalist who wrote a tremendous book on his local area of Selborne, down in the south of, of, of the country, and provided the inspiration for others to follow suit in this part of the world. John Whitehurst, Erasmus Darwin, the grandfather of Charles Darwin, and Arthur Aiken being three notable films. So we'll start with the, the person who was the senior of these three. That's John Whitehurst. Long before the days of photography, we have, though, personal portraits to give an idea of what these people um, were, were like. And from the, um, f f from the art gallery in Derby, we have um, a, a portrait of John Whitehurst. And do you notice, just in the right-hand side of his portrait, there's a picture of a volcano erupting. This was actually Vesuvius, that was erupting about the time at which this painting work, work was made. And John Whitehurst was fascinated by this um, eruption and seeing molten rock. Um, and, uh, and, the, and, and in fact, he, when he looked at the nature of the rocks in this part of the world, he actually made, for the first time, a deduction that some of them, at least, were the direct result of volcanic activity, akin to what he had seen in Vesuvius. And notable amongst these was what's called the Derbyshire Toadstone. Now, a toadstone, you might think, has something to do with magic mushrooms. But no, it actually comes from a corruption of the German Todstein, which means dead stone. During the Elizabethan period, knowledge of mining for metals was lost in this country. Essentially, um, <coughs> essentially material, uh, demand for metals was relatively low. What demand there was could be satisfied by importing metals from continental Europe. And the British mining industry collapsed totally. Sounds a bit familiar. As a result of which, when the need for metals became increased, during the, from the Jacobean, Jacobean through the Stuarts and onwards, with the development of Britain as, as a more of, of an empire than as an, a small country in its own right. So expertise for mining material had to be brought in from elsewhere, particularly from um, central and northern Germany. And hence the miners came across with their own terminology. So when the miners started to develop the mines, like around Snail Beach, which is famous for its, it, 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 its lead and a little bit of silver in the western part of Shropshire, so came with it the German terminology. And when the miners reached the limit of where the metals were in the ground, they came to the dead stone, it was called toadstone or Todstein. You can imagine how with local, um, uh, local pronunciation, how, how you could get that developing. <laughs> so, that was one major contribution by John Whitehurst. The other was the very first diagram of a section of what the <coughs> rocks actually looked like in Shropshire. And it's this diagram here, which was in, published in 1786 in a publication known as Inquiry. 
and it's the, a, a section of what you would see if you stripped away all the topsoil along the side of the Iron Bridge Gorge through Lincoln Hill. And I don't, we needn't worry about the, 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 the fine details, but do you notice there are a number of, uh, there's a series of letters, there's an A there, and then there's sort of C and G and such mm. like. Different letters there represent um, different layers of rock, which Whitehurst actually described in the, in the accompanying article. This is what's known now as a geological cross-section, but this was the first one ever to have been constructed in Shropshire. Well, a good contribution to be followed by a friend of, of John Whitehurst within the Lunar Society, Erasmus Darwin. Now, Erasmus Darwin was fascinated by many things about the world around him. And he was mates with one of the ironmasters in Ironbridge, William Reynolds, who was trying to drive a canal through from the banks of the Severn up towards where um, uh, um, he was getting, the, wanted the coal from in the area that we call um, Telford today. And to aid, ease that transport, he drew, got um, his, his workforce to drive a canal through from Culverdale um, northwards into the hillside. And in doing so, he came across a black oozing substance. <coughs> it was basically bit, what we would call now bitumen, a very heavy hydrocarbon. You can refine bitumen to make oil and petrol. This material was actually used as the basis of the, of the tar soap industry, which some of you may, 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 may recall. Um, to Darwin, this was really interesting, because he knew about John Whitehurst's Neptunist-like view of the world, all these layers of sediment that have been formed underwater. But looking at, the, um, at this tar, he said, look, where's this coming from? What you need to get tar is heat. There's heat in the interior of the Earth. We know that from the volcanoes that we can see popping out through the Earth's crust in various places around the, around the planet. Maybe that heat in places can get into our Shropshire rocks and effectively convert the coal, which we know lies within there, into bitumen. Now, chemically, we know that is no, not, like, not, the, not, not the way that it happens. But, although the wrong explanation, the linking between the heat and the effect of that on rocks is profoundly important. And what Darwin did was he then sat back and thought, right, what would the world be like if we could apply John Whitehurst's section across the whole planet? Remember, we're talking about a time when long before, 150 years before geophysics had been thought of, there wasn't any way in which you could physically see what was underneath the Earth's surface, other than by going into mines, which at most would only be a few hundred metres deep. Everything else had to be based on theory. So, within a book known as the Botanic Garden, Erasmus Darwin produced this cross-section through the Earth. Absolutely uh, uh, amazing that he could think through the structure of what the Earth's interior might be like. <laughs> At least I feel that's the case. And what we've got in here, for the front row, it's fine, you can read the text. <coughs> Towards the back, it may be a little tricky. So I'll just explain the key points of this diagram. What we have got is essentially a, 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 a diagram of a slice through the Earth. We've got the Earth's crust, and the Earth's crust has within it layers of, of rock, like John Whitehurst saw. So we've got coal, clay, loam, sand, limestone, <laughs> just to sort of pick up a few of the names. That's what John Whitehurst saw. There are places where there are volcanoes cutting through the Earth's crust. And if we, so if we take something like Vesuvius, for example, we have a volcano with lavas accumulating around the volcano. And as the volcano dies, maybe it gets covered by sediment from a re-advance of the sea, and so you can get, start to get alternating layers of rock that comes directly from a volcano with layers which are laid down in bodies of water like the sea or rivers. Driving all of this must be some internal production of heat. What Darwin calls on his diagram 
fire. So we've got the effect of fire in the Earth's interior. Well, after all, we know there's fire in there because that's where the devil lives. So many of his contemporaries would have thought. Um, producing the fire, that produced enough heat to melt rock and form volcanoes. That is essentially the essence of the Plutonist view of geology. Then there are various little notes added to this, which is um, that we have unknown regions which consist of lava. He's sort of trying to, in a semi-fluid state, so that's trying to explain what we get deeper below the layers of, of, of rock, below the crust. And within this, we've got various names like granite. Well, we know there's lots of granite, and so that's actually put on his diagram. But also there's small amounts of other kinds of rock, gneiss, um, porphyry, more stone, windstone. These are quite old-fashioned terms, geologically speaking, but I could give you modern equivalents to each of these. Effectively, this is a geology degree in a single diagram. <laughs> Not only that, he's got a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek <coughs> sense of humour, I feel. Because within the sediment, there's going to be water. If you've got water and it's been heated by the fire inside the Earth's interior, the water gets warmed up and you'll get warm springs. And look at the little spring taking the water up to the surface. It's a lovely <coughs> little touch which otherwise you might have overlooked. <laughs> now as far as Darwin was concerned, he felt that in order to try and work out where you have got coal and iron and limestone, the materials which are firing the Industrial Revolution, then you need to go from places like the Iron Bridge Gorge, where you know these materials exist, to other basins to try and correlate, in other words, find the equivalents, series of strata. So what really matters is identifying what there is within the rock sequence which is characteristic of those useful minerals to industrial development. Now, Darwin didn't know what it was, and unfortunately, he didn't physically overlap with his grandson. There was a gap of a few years between the death of Erasmus Darwin and the birth of Charles. So the lovely idea that the that, that, that granddad could have been putting the young Charles on his knee and telling him all about what the old world would be like and telling him to set forth on the beagle to prove it, I'm afraid he's just a figment of imagination. But, um, but, 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 but I think there is still something remarkable in this work, and I'd like to feel that Charles actually did look at this diagram at some point to fire his ideas about geology. Because you may or may not know that Charles Darwin began life as a geologist, and he then migrated to uh, natural history, which is, well, of course, what he's now, of course, famous for. His geology, exp his geology expertise largely forgotten. Um, anyway, there we are. That, 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 that's a bit of the story about Darwin's contribution to the geology. And the third person on my list of local naturalists was Arthur Aiken. Now, Arthur Aiken was um, a dissenting clergyman, so not terribly popular in this part of the world, and it certainly didn't pay the bills. Um, so he actually developed an, in, um, an interest in chemistry, again, through the Lunar Society, or, um, through, through their uh, activities, and became a professional lecturer in chemistry. And chemistry is linked very much to the production of raw materials from the Industrial Revolution, and hence his interest in geology. And eventually became, actually, a lecturer in geology too. Aiken's view was somewhat different from Darwin and Whitehurst. Aiken was fascinated by this other aspect of the picturesque movement, which is the development of landscapes, um, more primitive landscapes than the very ordered type of landscape with, with, with which um, the Jacobeans and the Elizabethans had faded. And this, um, di uh, this um, painting here, which I think is one of Ziegler's paintings, if I remember correctly, yes, one of Ziegler's paintings in the, in, in, in the Shropshire collection, um, illustrates the view along the river in, in Ludlow. Slightly exaggerates the height of the hills in the distance, which are the Clee Hills, but, but not to worry. It shows the interest con that contemporaries of Aiken had in landscape. And Aiken, though, felt that the landscape was reflected by the geology underneath. But how? The, this was before geological maps had been produced. William Smith, who you may have heard of in connection with the map that changed the world, according to Simon Winchester's thesis, didn't come for another two decades 
from the time in which Arthur Aiken was looking at the geology in this part of the world. But Aiken realised that in order to be able to realise Darwin's dream of, where, um, of, of how to relate the geology where you could see it to where you couldn't, you needed to produce some kind of three-dimensional map of the ground which showed not only the surface topology but also what occurred with depth, what we nowadays call a geological map. So what Aiken wanted to do was basically develop such a map for this part of the world. Now the problem was, how was he going to, um, how was he going to um, achieve this with virtually no money? Um, he hit on the idea of writing a prospectus. Effectively, it's, it's an invitation to invest in him, the man, to do the work. He called this a proposal for a mineralogical survey of the county of Shropshire. Now, mineral mineralogy at this time is what we would call geology today. Um, it contrasted with the study of ancient creatures, paleontology, which is looking at fossils. So minerals and fossils were the way in which people looked at the ground at this time in the early 1800s. So Aiken used the term mineralogical survey he meant geological in terms of the terminology we'd use today. And this became the first pub... Uh, to, to do this, he felt he had to show what could be achieved. And what he did was he took John Whitehurst's idea through Ironbridge, and instead, using landforms, he produced an equivalent section through the ground to the south, through the Stretton Hills, and up onto Wenlock Edge. And here is the map that was published five years before William Smith's map was first published of the geology of this part of the world. So what we have here is um, the, the Longmind, Stretton Valley, Carcaradoc and Radcliffe, and then running into Apedale and up onto Wenlock Edge. And the different shades of grey reflect the different rock types, which he explains in the, in the caption, which we didn't worry ourselves about today. So, um, effectively, what this was showing is, if you gave me money, this is to Arthur Aiken, I can go across Shropshire and tell you what the nature of the subterranean rocks are, and from that, you, as wealthy landowners, can see if you become fabulously wealthy because you happen to be sitting on limestone or iron ore or coal, which were the materials which the Industrial Revolution wanted to fuel its manufacturing processes. Unfortunately, it fell on deaf ears. Arthur Aiken was not moving in the right social circles to meet with people who were prepared to just give him money. And it founded, and, he, and, and, and it wasn't until two decades later that he met with another um, <coughs> um, a, a person who was well-connected and really started to put the geology of this part of the world on the map. But by this time, William Smith had published his map and instead of us celebrating this year the 200th anniversary of the production of the geological map that changed the world, we would, we, we would have done it five years ago with Arthur Aiken's proposal. And maybe he would have been even more famous than Charles Darwin, who knows? But history is littered with, with, with the casualties of, 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 this sort of, of this sort of type. So... This is the landscape then that um, we, we have, the landscape through which Arthur Aiken wanted to try and, and develop an understanding. Um, we've got here a view looking northward. The glaciers are long since gone, of course, in this aerial photograph. Um, uh, Shrewsbury off to the left. We've got Wenlock Edge itself running through here. There is a parallel ridge um, called View Edge, which runs behind it, and um, a valley, a lovely little secluded valley in between, and then in the distance we've got the Rekin up there. Now this, um, th 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 this, this diagram is um, a reflection of the land use, which, is, which, which, which people make of it today with the network of fields and um, roads, woodlands and so on that we have it we have through it the classical physical geography view of the world and within this classical physical geography of the world we have a series of 
um, of, of, of rivers running through the landscape. And traditionally, the thought is that it is the rivers which cause the development of the landscape in this fashion. However, mm, there are other ways of looking at that. We've already looked at the effect of ice moving over Shropshire. Ice has carved through the landscape as well. As the ice melted, we have rivers much bigger than the rivers of today, which have spread their way through the landforms which survived from before the glaciations to modify the landscape, <coughs> such as the development of the Iron Bridge Gorge. Wind has had an effect on the landscape. The list could go on. But I'm conscious that you traditionally end the talks at about 22, um, uh, at about 22, and I thought it might just be helpful to allow a little bit of time for questions um, to talk about, the, uh, to, to raise any points you might have about the things that I've talked to you about. And if you want to know what happened before all of this, then you might need to invite me back again. But I'll leave that for you to decide. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, the, the, the number of things follow from that. Um, I, I, it's the the way that temperature the way that the temperature affects the UK. So, if we concentrate on what, ha what what's like to happen in this country, it's been predicted that if the average air temperature dropped two degrees compared to what it does at the moment, this is the average temperature then we would have permanent ice forming in the Cairngorms. So just a two degree drop would give us permanent ice in the Cairngorms. Once you have got permanent ice formed, each winter more snow will fall, it would add to that volume of ice and the ice mass will get bigger and bigger. As the ice, ma as the ice mass gets bigger, it will create a zone of, uh, well, first thing it will do is it will um, mean that any wind blowing over the ice will be unable to pick up moisture. It will become drier than it would otherwise be. So over large ice sheets, winds, the air, and winds that blow from it are dry. And as the ice sheet gets bigger also, it will tend, because of the whiteness of the, of, of, of the surface of the ice mass, it will tend to reflect solar energy. So the sun's energy coming down into that part of the landscape will become decreased in terms of its transmission down into the ground beneath. So you're progressively, with the growth of ice, reflecting more of the sun's energy away, so it's getting colder, and you're drying the atmosphere. Now, with that, it means that with the drier the atmosphere, the less chance you have got liquid water, rain, for those of you who've forgotten what it's called, because it's been so lovely and dry the last few weeks, um, that rainwater is an important way for heat to get from the atmosphere down into the interior of an ice sheet. Um, because as the rain falls as rain, as opposed to as snow, so it can get through the little cracks and so on within the ice, and it transmits heat into the ice. And one of the reasons why ice sheets collapse, in other words, they speed up very, very quickly towards the end of their life, is because water gets from the surface during the summer melt, together with rainwater, gets down through crevasses into the basal part of the glacial ice. And there, it basically both warms up the base of the glacier and it adds, in effect, a lubricating layer. And essentially, the ice itself starts to skid outwards and the whole speed with which the ice moves gets out of equilibrium and effectively the ice mass collapses. That's what the great worry of the, uh, of, of the climate change people is to what is observed in Greenland at the moment and to a lesser extent the, Arctic ice sheet, the Antarctic ice sheet is because it seems that the crevasses are opening up more and more liquid water is getting in during the summer and it's heating up the base of the glaciers. 
And that's something that takes tens of years to develop, maybe centuries to develop. It will take an equivalent amount of time to put right, but we don't have that time. And once an ice mass collapses, you can't stop it. And that is where you get this, this reinforcement of the global effect on climate and, and all the serious consequences that come from it. So there's a long answer to your question, but, but, but hopefully that answers the point um, that you, you wanted. So two degrees drop will be enough to get permanent ice back in the UK. And uh, Marilyn would like to give a word to say. Hi, thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Professor Rosenbaum, for your most fascinating talk. And I know when a lot of you go out on your walks, you'll be looking at those features of the Shropshire countryside with a little more interest. The meres that are the kettle holes in the north, and perhaps going along Wenlock Edge and so on. I particularly, as a geographer, would have loved to have gone on a field trip, but I suspect 250 of the rest of us would have been a little bit difficult to cope with with risk assessment and things on the side of the River Severn. I have a daughter-in-law who's a geologist, so I feel I'll be able to make slightly more intelligent comments about the county. I loved hearing all those words. I'm a human geographer, so I found all those words from many years ago, drumlins, till, boulder clay, uh, moraine, it was fascinating. And I, I do think the threat of a new ice age is slightly concerning for us, as our questioner asked. But it is a fascinating view of the development of glaciers in our area. And I was most amused that the Welsh were attacking us from an earlier age. <laughs> 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 uh, and I was Welsh Gorge being uh, of course the base of all this um, manufacturing industry uh, was first made possible by the geological uh, inputs there. And then, of course, we had so many famous geologists coming from this area. That's what's so fascinating. Perhaps why you ended up settling here. I don't know. It would be interesting. And I love the idea of the Lunar Society being a very early version of the U3A. Uh, I hope some of them might be bright enough to make some of their uh, discoveries. I'm not sure. I think these days we like to relax more, don't we, and learn. So thank you so much. I particularly found it fascinating, and I know a lot of the people here do. So many thanks to you. I'd just like to mention something mentioned in the Guardian newspaper last week as a review of a, a university. It describes it as, its students come there for the delight of learning alongside other people driven by the same need. It has no place in league tables and the fees come to less than the participants might spend on coffee. The price of attendance is time and commitment. No wonder it is growing. The U3A is, in some senses, the only real university left in Britain. <laughs>